Let me tell you a story, the abbot said. It's a private story, almost like a secret, between myself, my confessor, Prior Michelangelo, and God. I can tell you, can't I? You won't tell anyone? The children's faces were frozen, staring at the sharp object, a tool for removing waxen seal that was now touching the soft underside of Glencourt's throat. When I was a lad, the abbot began, his voice low beneath the ceaseless banging, his boy, eyes as honest and clear as ever. I had a friend, a best friend, and yet a rival too, as best friends often are. We attended university in Paris, and it was impossible to tell who was more brilliant, he or I. We wanted to know everything, to plumb the depths of the divine plan, to understand all creation from the Garden of Eden until today. Still, Hubert stroked Glencourt's head. One day, we made a vow, this friend and I. We vowed that whoever died first should return after the space of one week and tell the other whether the afterlife is indeed real, as the church teaches us, or whether Epicurus is right and we are nothing but particles, millions of atoms bouncing off one another. To keep this promise, we began to explore the black arts, magic, spells, and sacrifices that would give us freedom, so it was said, to return from that dark, final country. A candle flame stood straight and tall in the dark room, quivering only when the banging shook the chamber. Hubert's gray eyes flickered to the thick wooden door and back to the children. Still, with one hand, he stroked Gwen Fort, and with the other, he held the knife to her soft, white throat. Well, my friend died very young, far before I expected to lose him. I was much grieved, but also I was afraid. I was no longer certain I wanted him to return from the grave. A week went by and he did not. I was relieved and only a little disappointed. Clearly, the ancient philosophers had been right. We are but atoms and there is no life hereafter. The banging had become frantic again. Jean, Jean was glazing at the candlelight, reflecting off Hubert's blade. A year went by, two. The pale, gray-eyed abbot went on. And then one night, as I lay in bed, he appeared before me. Who, your friend? William could not help but ask. Indeed, young oblate, my friend, truly? Do not doubt as I did, the abbot said, his voice gentle, his eyes honest as ever. They could all see it. He was not lying. My friend appeared before me, and so horrible a sight you have never, ever seen. His flesh was white and rent in strips. His innards hung from his body. His teeth had been shattered like glass. His eyes were the worst. His eyes were deep and sleepless and so, so desperate. The abbot's voice crackled. He called to me and said he was sorry, sorry that he had not come sooner, sorry that he had, had led me to practice the ways of the devil, sorry that he had led me to the brink of hell. I begged him to explain. He had said he had been tortured and tormented in the inferno since the day he died, and only now had he been granted the right to come and see me and to warn me that soon he would plunge back into that endless despair, never to emerge again. Turn from error, he said to me, turn from arrogance. Commit yourself to God, become a monk, be as pure as you can be. Every day of your life, fight the evil of the devil. And he flipped his hand at me and blood flew from an open wound and struck me here on the chest. With the hand that held the blade, Abbot Hubert pulled down his habit just enough to reveal three dark pitted scars as if droplets of acid had fallen on his chest. Bang, 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 bang. Knocking was more frantic than ever. But Hubert was not disturbed. And so I have never forgotten the torment of my dearest friend. And whenever the devil leads poor sinners astray with the black magic and false saints, I rescued them from their error. He stared at the children with his frank gray eyes, willing them to understand more banging. His voice trembled. That is why I ordered your grave destroy, grove destroyed. That is why I must kill your dog, sweet as she seems. He stroked Glenford's head, and she stared up at him, apparently hypnotized, immobilized by his words and his soothing hand, save for a faint tremor in her legs. Once she is dead, 
I will have you three burned as well as false saints and practitioners of the arts of the devil. He said it as though it was the only possible option among many very sad ones. Some will say you were saints, martyred for your beliefs, but we will know the truth. The hand that held the blade pressed into Gwen for, for its throat. A bead of blood emerged from the white fur and ran down the smooth steel. Gwenford whined and tried to shy away, but the small, honest bear tightened his grip and pressed harder. Bang! This bang was different. It was louder and was accompanied by the sound of tearing metal and a great boom followed. Everyone, Gwenford included, looked to the doorway. There, as large and red and furious as the devil himself stood Michelangelo de Bologna. He strode onto the door, which had been ripped from its hinges, had broken through the door braces, and lay on the ground. It appeared to be smoking. Uber! Michelangelo bellowed, his voice deep and rich with just a hint of Italian in it. Put down that knife, stand up, release that dog! To the children's amazement, Uber did exactly as Michelangelo instructed. He rose to his feet, letting the blade fall to the stone floor. When Ford bounded over to Jeanne, a small red line ran across her throat, but the cut was not deep. You are a sinner, Hubert, Michelangelo said. You know it, I know it, God knows it. Do not compound your sin on the flesh of the innocent. It shall not cleanse. They are worshippers of the devil, Hubert objected earnestly. Practitioners of black magic. Who? These children, the dog, don't be an idiot. Michelangelo's eyes were blazing like the fires of hell itself. Maybe Jean, Jean suddenly thought like the fires of heaven. Children, come with me. Hubert, do not test my patience again. Jean, with Gwen Fort at her side, hurried to the smoking broken door. Jacob and William followed as quickly as they could. As they stepped over the door, it was locked, and into the hallway they saw Gerard, Gerald, cowering against the opposite wall. Michelangelo, he cried, rising to his feet. What have you done? What are you doing with these children? Michelangelo peered down from his massive, ruddy, whiskered face onto the pale Scotsman. Gerald, he said, you are a good man. You mean well, but you are a fool. Stay out of the way before you do harm that cannot be undone. With that, Michelangelo continued down the hallway, Jean looking at the cowering Gerald and then after the great prior of Saint Denis. She had a decision to make, and she had just a moment to make it. Follow the red monk who had saved them, but had terrified her dreams for years, or ask Gerard, their sworn protector, to take them someplace far away from this confusing and frightening place. And then Gwen Fort made the decision for her. The white greyhound darted after the great red monk and trotted happily at his heels. Jean stared for a moment and she and the other children hurried to catch up. Sometimes it turns out the most important decisions in life are made by your dog. They followed Michelangelo de Bologna through the corridors of Saint Denis, one after another, too quickly to have any idea where they were going or where they were going. Finally, they, pa pa Finally, they passed through a thick wooden door, which Michelangelo used a long iron key to bolt behind them, and out into a narrow alley. They were outside the abbey walls. Michelangelo led them down the muddy lane and veered off into another. There, he came to a green door. Jacob noticed that on the door frame, there was a small oblong box. He pulled up short. Is that a mezuza? he asked. Michelangelo ignored him, knocking with his enormous fist, it was nearly the size of Jean's head, on the flimsy door. After a moment, they heard the sound of a woman's voice, coming, coming. As they waited, hearts pounded from their flights from the monastery and the strange, terrifying encounter that they had had there. Jean looked at Michelangelo with red whiskers and fiery eyes and a fierce, fat face that had haunted her her entire life. Now, maybe rescuing them, maybe? William, beside her, gazed at the great man, too. Despite all that he had heard of him, the tales of his wickedness, he suddenly felt a strange affinity for the giant cleric, like he had at last met someone of his own species. Jacob, meanwhile, stared in wonder at the mezuzah, the tiny prayer scroll that hangs on the doorframe of a Jewish home. Why were they here? 
The green door opened. Standing in the doorway was a plump older woman with gray hair pulled back in a messy bun behind her head. From within the house, the unmistakable smell of boiling chicken broth flooded the alley. Michelangelo, she cried, I'm making dumpling soup. You always know. Come in, come in, and who are these? Michelangelo pushed the children inside. Close the door if you would, William. The big boy complied. The plump woman stood before them expectantly. Children, Michelangelo intoned, may I introduce Miriam, wife of the great rabbi? At that moment, they heard the thud of a cane on the thin wooden floorboards and an old man hob hobbled around the corner. He was bent over his walking stick and his long white beard hung almost to his waist, but his eyes were bright and lively. And this, Michelangelo announced, is her very lucky husband, Rabbi Yehuda. Jacob's legs went wobbly beneath him. These, Michelangelo continued, now speaking to Yehuda and his wife and indicating the children with a sweep of his hand, are the saints. I practically jumped from my stool. He called them saints, you're sure? The little nun smiles placidly at me. What does that matter to you so much? Jerome asked, turning on me. You seem rather preoccupied by that fact. I return his gaze. After a moment, I look back at the nun. Do you know more, I asked her? Indeed, I do, 